thanks very much for coming today to this lecture uh, to honor Professor Bob Lowry on his retirement. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, uh, Fred Zacharias, a very distinguished legal ethics scholar, I want to talk a little bit about Bob Lowry. Uh, he has his BA from Fordham, his JD from Penn. Uh, after seven years practicing in Pittsburgh and then a year as a fellow at Harvard, he started his teaching career here, and that was 1975, and he has been a lifer. He has been on this faculty since. Uh, he's taught a variety of different courses, particularly criminal law, jurisprudence, and legal ethics. He has been the director of the Law School Center for Professional Ethics uh, since 1979. He's authored two books and many articles, principally in the area of legal ethics. Uh, to really understand his place, I think, in the law school, reading his C CV or my recounting it really isn't adequate. You, you have to attend a faculty meeting. Uh, and I, I will tell you, uh, faculty, all faculty, but especially law faculty, are very independent-minded, uh, not easily persuaded of anything. I don't know how many minds are ever changed at a faculty meeting, except, I think, when Bob Lowry speaks. And uh, to me, as a newcomer last year, my first year on the faculty here, it was obvious when he spoke, people actually listened. Uh, and th that was a real testament, I think, to the high esteem uh, in which he is held in the faculty and in the law school in general. Uh, when he told me at the start of the last academic year that he was planning to retire, I, of course, did my best to dissuade him. Uh, I pointed out to him he still had not even had the advantage of going to a Bob Dylan concert with me. Uh, but um, it was pretty clear he wasn't going to change his mind, in particular because he had this long list of things and interesting things that he was planning to do. It was pretty clear he was retiring so he could be more active in a lot of things that he simply hadn't been able to fit in. Uh, so ranging from things you might expect a law professor to do, writing projects in his, in his area of legal ethics, but also creative writing, travel, and many other things. Uh, this is someone uh, who, who truly is, in the, in the word of a great poet, uh, forever young, and that really is Bob. Uh, the law school, I think, uh, at least in terms of his not being in the classroom, I think I told him could survive that, but not, not having him around. And I'm really thrilled that he agreed that he was going to keep very active in the school. He maintains an office in the school. He's around. Uh, and his voice of reason is one that uh, I would hate to lose in faculty meetings and elsewhere. Uh, before we go on any further, I wanted to present him with an award. So, Bob, if you could just come up for a second. So, we can read it to everyone. It says, to great, in grateful appreciation of Robert P. Lowry on your retirement, after 33 years of stellar teaching scholarship and institutional service. So, Let me talk briefly then about today's speaker. Fred Zacharias is the Herzog Research Professor uh, at the University of San Diego Law School. Uh, he has his BA from Johns Hopkins and his JD from Yale. He has an LLM, a Master's in Law, from Georgetown, where he was a Prettyman Fellow. Uh, he had a federal district court clerkship in Philadelphia did a few years of practice in public interest law in D.C., and then began teaching at Cornell Law School. Uh, he moved several years later after, after being at Cornell. He moved to San Diego, giving up the balmy winters of Ithaca for the harsh climate of Southern California. Uh, he uh, has taught legal ethics, constitutional law, and criminal procedure written in those areas. He is remarkably prolific. Uh, for years, he's been turning out three, four articles a year. 
uh, especially noteworthy because his articles are not sort of, he wrote it once, now he'll even write it again for you. Uh, his articles really vary one from the other. Uh, he really is, I've known him for years, uh, really one of the most creative people I, I've seen in legal academia. Uh, and his work is really carefully done. So three or four articles a year is a reflection of a lot of hard work. Uh, I had the, the pleasure and privilege of overlapping with him a few years at Cornell. I asked him to spend this week here as a visiting scholar and to give this lecture in Bob Lowry's honor. I'm delighted that he was able to do this. Uh, before he begins, let me mention that at the end of his address, he will take questions. Uh, if you would, just raise your hand. You'll be handed a microphone, so wait for the microphone to speak so everyone will be able to hear you. There's a reception afterward, uh, and I hope people will join us then. So uh, please welcome now our guest speaker, Prof Professor Fred Zacharias. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I'm sorry my mother wasn't here to hear the introduction. She would have believed every word. Um, but uh, I, I'm delighted to be here with all of you, and I'm particularly thrilled at uh, having been designated to speak in Bob Lowry's honor. I've, I've been a big fan of his work for a lot of years. Uh, I have to start by saying that I teach Socratically, so I, I'm not used to giving lengthy lectures. Uh, but as I understand our assignments here today, my job is to talk and yours is to listen, and it would be very unseemly if I finished my job first. Uh, so, so I decided to work through an issue with you uh, that is both controversial and, and highlights why I consider professional responsibility to be a stimulating field. And I hope I can induce you to share my enthusiasm for it. A wise man once said that the whole point of applied ethics is to see where we stand and how we might act in the real world. We have to get the paradigm straight. So let's look at the paradigm that many people consider the core of the adversary system. It's Henry Lord Broom's 19th century statement that an advocate in the discharge of his duty knows but one person in all the world, and that person is his client. Reflecting on Broom's paradigm, the wise man reached this conclusion. Lord Broom uttered hyperbolic nonsense. For the wise man, the real question for law students and practicing lawyers was this. How should the lawyer behave given that particular role as champion within the confines of the adversary system? What means are appropriate to ends that often seem and often are inconsistent with justice or good morals as those terms are understood by the average reasonable citizen? The wise man, as you, some of you might have guessed, is Bob Lowry. And he wrote this in an important article in 1990 entitled The Central Moral Tradition of Lawyering. Bob understood that being a good lawyer, a good and upstanding lawyer, is difficult business. And having a little bit of a philosopher in him, he told me yesterday that he spent a year in Oxford when he was young thinking about becoming a philosopher full time, but having a little bit of a philosopher in him, he resisted the proposition that simple formulas like Lord Broom's paradigm can uniformly resolve lawyers' moral dilemmas. That's a lesson Bob helped teach me, and I thank him for that. What I'd like to do today in Bob's honor is to spell the complication out a bit, to move closer to getting the paradigm right, or rather, to getting the paradigms right. I'm going to suggest that single-minded approaches to legal ethics simply cannot provide all the answers. You may have heard the joke about the old farmer who was sitting on his porch one day when a stranger came up the walk. And the stranger asked, is that your cow down by the road? She brown, the farmer replied. Yes. That's Bessie. Well, let me ask you a question, the farmer said. How much is that cow worth? The farmer responded thoughtfully, well, that depends. Do you want to buy the cow? Are you the tax man, or have you just run her over? <laughs> what that joke illustrates, of course, is that reasonable people often have different perspectives. And nowhere is that more evident than in the field of professional responsibility. 
So let me start today's subject by offering a little background for those of you who are not initiated in the field. Legal ethicists essentially divide into three camps. Uh, one group adheres to the ultra-adversarial norm proposed by Lord Broome, you saw that on the board, and sponsored most fiercely today by Monroe Friedman. For them, the adversarial ethic governs all else. Lawyers have to abide by the law and professional codes, but even these have to be read in light of uh, and interpreted in light of the lawyer's exclusive obligation to serve his client's interests. At the other extreme is a camp which actually assumes that practitioners and legal ethics codes actually adopt the broom uh, friedman approach. Uh, but they challenge it. These scholars, starting with David Hoffman in the 1800s and led by David Luban and William Simon today, distrust justifications for lawyer conduct based on the adversary system. They suggest that lawyers should exercise broad moral discretion that trumps norms of role-differentiated or role-based behavior. Now, I and several others, and, and maybe Bob Lowry, but you'll have to ask him, um, fall into the third camp. Uh, we acknowledge the significance of the adversary process, but we argue that in practice, the American legal system just isn't as one-dimensional as Friedman claims or as the Hoffman-Luben camp assumes. In, in a seminal article in the Wisconsin Law Review, Ted Schneer established that modern legal ethics codes already accord lawyers significant moral discretion. Bruce Green and I have illustrated that historically, there always has been a give and take between legal ethics regulation and judicial regulation of lawyers, which in the end has produced a standard for advocacy that accepts neither the Broom Friedman nor the Hoffman Luban view. Rather, there's a middle ground based on professional norms, understandings, and professional conscience that limits lawyers on questioning adherence to client interests while still incorporating the basic elements of role differentiation. So that's the background. So let's consider Professor Friedman's most recent illustration of how he believes legal ethics should work. Uh, I should say that Friedman has never been my biggest fan, and uh, that's, that's uh, an understatement. So it may be a mistake to provoke him uh, with this lecture, um, which is, after all, a, a subject that's his pet territory. Uh, there's an old saying about having a picnic with a tiger. You may enjoy the meal, but tigers always eat last. Um, <laughs> or to borrow another animal metaphor, maybe I should follow the advice of an old clinical professor of mine uh, who used to say, don't wrestle with pigs, because pigs love it and you'll get muddy. Um, still, for all my disagreements with Professor Friedman, I have to say that he's always provocative, and his latest paper has made me think, so I thought you too might enjoy contemplating his claims. And this is Friedman's question. Should lawyers ever intentionally lie to a court? Lies are absolutely forbidden by all professional codes. Most judges and lawyers would be horrified by the notion that the prohibition is optional or defeasible and one might expect that to end the question. But Friedman rebels, and, and that brings to mind a famous Senate hearing uh, at, at which Justice O'Connor was testifying about a, a similarly unambiguous statute that the Supreme Court had enforced. And, and Senator Rudman quite seriously looked her, at the eye, looked her in the eye and said, Madam Justice, Congress gets very upset sometimes when you interpret laws exactly as we have written them. Uh, li like Senator Rudman, uh, Professor Reedman concludes that despite the rules flatly forbidding lying, there are circumstances in which zealous representation can require a lawyer to make a false statement to a court or to engage in other conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. Now here's Friedman's most interesting illustration, and it's the one I want to focus on. Suppose a judge routinely calls a criminal defense lawyer to the bench, calls all criminal defense lawyers to the bench before trial and says, let's move this along. Did he do it or didn't he? Now, obviously, this puts lawyers in a terrible position. If the lawyer's client is guilty and the lawyer says so, he breaches confidentiality and hurts the client. If the client is innocent and the lawyer responds with a comment like, I can't answer that question, the judge may assume his client is guilty. Friedman's answer is that the judge has, is that the judge has acted in, improperly and that therefore the lawyer is justified in lying, in always answering 
I have no doubt that my client is not guilty, even if the opposite is true. Well, I was a former criminal defense lawyer, and my initial reaction to uh, Friedman's view was pretty sympathetic. After all, lawyers typically shouldn't act against their clients' interests. Uh, confidentiality rules do promise clients that they can tell their lawyers about their guilt or, guilt or innocence with the assurance that the lawyer isn't going to reveal the information. But then I started thinking about the ramifications of Friedman's position. Suppose a lawyer always tells the judge his guilty clients are innocent. When the question is asked about an innocent defendant, the lawyer's word will mean much less. In effect, the lawyer has thrown one set of clients under the bus for the other. That, of course, is not a new conundrum. Uh, what should a lawyer do when a prosecutor offers deals for two clients, one of which is favorable and the other not, and makes them conditional on both clients accepting? Or, and, and this is something I did a lot as a defense attorney, uh, should a lawyer whose word is considered trustworthy sometimes go to a prosecutor or a sentencing judge and volunteer his personal view that a client is a good risk for a particular type of diversion or probation? Like in Friedman's hypothetical, the failure to do the same for a less appealing client suggests to the prosecutor or court that the client is unworthy. Conversely, making the same appeal for all clients leads prosecutors and judges to distrust the lawyer's word, even when a specific client deserves the benefit of the doubt. Broom and Friedman, of course, would say that the lawyer must always do what's best for the client, acting in the moment in which the lawyer represents the client. But let me hearken back to our wise man, Bob Lowry. Bob's work suggests that there is no such thing as a client without a legal system within which the words lawyer and client have meaning. When Lord Broom said that a lawyer must know no person other than a client, or other than his client, he assumed that each lawyer has but one client. In fact, most lawyers have many clients. Broom's statement also ignores the reality that lawyers serve their clients in the context of a legal system which by definition prescribes limits on lawyers' behavior. So here's why Professor Friedman's response to his own hypothetical is unsatisfying. It's based almost entirely on the following axiom. For more than a century, the lawyer's ethic of zeal has required and has inspired entire devotion to the client. Given this tautological description of the lawyer's ethic, Friedman has no problem concluding that a lie to the court is the response that is consistent with zeal, confidentiality, competence, and the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Friedman's only support for the notion that the hypothetical lawyer's lie is morally justifiable equivocation is the lawyer's role as an advocate and the fact that the court has acted wrongfully. Friedman doesn't consider why the ethics codes include strict prohibitions against lying, and he assumes the prohibitions to be secondary to Broom's single ethic of devotion to the client. And I'd suggest that's wrong, both descriptively and as a norm for appropriate behavior. Contrary to Professor Friedman's suggestion, no professional code ever has adopted Broom's proposition as the definition of a lawyer's role. The codes regulate lawyers in all their functions. However strong the justifications for broom-like advocacy might be in the context of criminal defense litigation, they, for lawyers who serve as advisors, as counselors, and facilitators of cooperative ventures, the ethic often seems out of place. More to the point, from the 1908 canons of ethics forwards, and those were the first major can uh, legal ethics codes, the legal ethics codes have always advised lawyers that they sometimes do need to know persons other than their clients, for example, in refraining from suborning perjury. That's because, historically, the codes took their cues from judicial regulation of lawyers, and judges universally perceived the function of lawyers as helping courts identify the truth. The connection between professional and judicial regulation persists today, and never once has the, the package of ethics regulation ever explicitly or implicitly adopted the unitary view of the lawyer's role that Friedman claims is overriding. As John Adams once said, facts are stubborn things. On close examination, the codes actually recognized several roles for lawyers other than being clients' champions. The obvious one is the lawyer's role as officer of the court, 
And by that, I don't mean a fuzzy general concept that judges may use sometimes, but uh, I don't think of this as a general concept that, that, that would undermine the lawyer's advocacy role. It actually encompasses some very concrete duties that lawyers have. We've mentioned that lawyers are not supposed to lie to, to, to judges, but there are other everyday officer of the court duties that also are directly contradictory to serving the client's interests. The lawyer may not introduce false evidence. He must advise a court of controlling precedent. He may not make frivolous claims. He must obey discovery rules. The list goes on. A related role of lawyers is that of making sure the legal system operates in its intended fashion. For example, a lawyer may not speak with a represented person or a represented party, which preserves the adversary's ability to use her lawyer as the system envisions. In most jurisdictions, a lawyer has to tell an opposing attorney about inadvertently disclosed documents, documents that he sent by mistake, so she can raise possible legal claims to get the documents back. Under the old code of professional responsibility that's still in effect in a lot of states, a lawyer must inform a court of even an opposing witness's perjury, even if that wouldn't help his client, to make sure the system operates on the basis of truthful testimony. It's impossible to reconcile these obligations with Lord Broom's model because they require lawyers to act specifically to preserve third-party interests in a properly functioning legal process. The lawyer must know someone other than his client. Now, Bob Lowry has suggested that the lawyer's first obligation is to the system of law itself. And for Bob, if the primary duty of the lawyer is to the processes, procedures, and institutions of the law, the lawyer is the client's champion only within that realm, and only in ways the laws, social mores, and moral traditions of lawyering within that realm allow. Now, I'm not sure I agree that the obligation to the institutions of the law is a lawyer's first obligation, but it clearly is one of the functions that legal ethics regulators have always emphasized. And Bob correctly suggests that if lawyers truly are officers of the law, until we say what we expect from officers of the law, we invite chaos. So there's the first questionable aspect of Friedman's position on the lying lawyer his notion that lawyers have a single role. In fact, there are several. They are not always consistent, and nothing in the codes or history confirms Friedman's view that the champion's role controls in the event of a conflict. As I said, I'm not used to lecturing, and my rule of thumb for, for speaking in public has always been the advice of uh, Louis Neiser, the, the, the famous trial lawyer who used to say about closing, making closing arguments, if you haven't struck oil in 15 minutes, stop boring. Um, <laughs> I, I see I've spoken that long already, so I'm really hoping you're still with me. Uh, but on the assumption that you are, um, here's the second consideration that militates against Professor Friedman's approach. Truth-telling by lawyers is efficient. It would be possible to develop a legal system in which everyone assumes that lawyers lie in their clients' interests, in court, in negotiations, in conversations, the ramifications of that system would be caveat emptor. Distrust lawyers at all times. Check the facts, obtain full discovery before settling, be prepared to challenge every statement the adversary makes. Does that world frighten you? Well, the inefficiencies inherent in that world are part of the reason courts and code drafters have insisted that lawyers be candid. Lawyers may avoid answering some questions, they may draw inferences from the facts. They may even may engage in puffing in negotiations. But when a lawyer speaks, we want to be able to rely on his word. And that's why when I used to go to prosecutors and assure them that I had checked and that my client was in a position to fulfill certain promises, the prosecutors would believe me. That's why my arguments at sentencing meant something to the court. The ability to trust lawyers is important for clients, lawyers, and judges alike. So now we come to the most important omission in Professor Friedman's analysis. Legal ethics, the codes and other constraints on lawyer behavior, embrace not just multiple roles for lawyers, but also many values other than client and systemic interests. Consider, for example, exceptions to attorney-client confidentiality that sometimes allow lawyers to prevent harm. 
These exceptions are based on third-party interests that trump the principle of zeal. Similarly, ethics rules that encourage lawyers to discuss moral and political considerations with clients recognize independent goods. Prohibitions against lying and dishonesty are based on notions of integrity. This isn't the time or place to get into the range of ethics rules that respect particular values. It's enough for our purposes to note that a range exists, informing lawyers that they can't resolve all dilemmas with single-minded devotion to the advocate's ethic. ethic. The codes tell us, to, or tell lawyers, to effectuate the adversary system, but also to consider universal moral principles, including the notion that lawyers, like everyone else, ordinarily should not lie. Now, I've suggested that uh, Friedman's analysis lacks some key components, uh, but that doesn't resolve the specific question facing our hypothetical lawyer. The judge has asked the lawyer whether his client is guilty. How should the lawyer answer? I have to warn you, for warn you, that any answer I give here uh, is going to put me into a position just as vulnerable as Professor Friedman's. Uh, that no-win situation makes me feel like Abraham and Moish, two 19th century Russian Jews who found themselves in front of a Cossack firing squad. Uh, at the key moment, uh, they were offered blindfolds. No blindfold, Abraham said bravely. Moish timidly plucked at Abraham's sleeve and whispered, Abe, don't cause trouble. <laughs> well, though, though the light Abe, I may be heading for trouble here, uh, though I may be heading for trouble here, uh, let me try to suggest how Friedman's hypothetical should come out. It clearly is not enough to conclude that lying helps the client, uh, nor does the fact that the judge acted improperly resolve the issue. Why exactly should two wrongs make a right? Uh, the lawyer needs to balance a series of conflicting values, loyalty to this client, systemic interests in reassuring all clients that lawyers will act in their interests, systemic interests in enabling clients, judges, and other attorneys to trust the lawyer's word, Bob Lowry's obligation to the processes, procedures, and institutions of the law, the lawyer's personal integrity, and universal ethical principles. Friedman's proposed lie serves only the first two values, loyalty and making clients feel secure about their representation. Telling the truth serves only the last two values, personal integrity and universal morality. There's an ambiguity with respect to the obligation to legal institutions, the various obligations to legal institutions, because full candor would help judicial efficiency but undermine the legitimate institutional imperatives of the adversary system. Which brings us to the third option, which suddenly begins to appear more appealing, informing the judge politely that her question is inappropriate and that you will not answer for reasons of principle. This enables the lawyer to tell the truth and preserves the system as it is intended to operate. The answer also is loyal to, to the client in the same way that refusing to suborn perjury is consistent with loyalty. The client may not like it, uh, but candor is part of the rules of the game. But this analysis, again, is just too simple because I've ignored the innocent client. Innocent clients would be helped by the honest response, my client did not do it, just like my own clients used to be helped when I vouched for them to prosecutors. Don't these clients have a right to a truthful statement that will serve their cause? When their lawyers insist on telling the judge, the question is inappropriate and I will not answer it, aren't the lawyers now throwing them under the bus in favor of the guilty clients? There is an answer. And it lies in Bob Lowry's words that I quoted before, and they're still up there. Um, but I'm not sure I'm comfortable with the resulting solution, uh, nor am I sure Bob would apply his words to, to, the, to this situation, uh, which brings to mind the story, it's possibly an apocryphal story, about a university president in the 1960s who was complaining about the big budget of the Department of Physics. And he said, why, oh, why do you need all this expensive equipment? Look at the mathematicians. All they ask for is papers, pencils, and erasers. Then he thought for a second longer and said, you know, law professors are even better. They don't even ask for erasers. <laughs> um, <laughs> unlike those law professors who'd, who'd never erase their conclusions, I have to admit to you that I'm still unsure about my position here, and, and I might still recant. Uh, I just hope that I don't, by misusing Bob Lowry's legacy in the process, cause Bob to regret his words. 
Um, but here's what, I re here's what I glean from Bob's observations. If the lawyer's first obligation truly is to the processes and institutions of the legal system, and if the lawyer is the client's champion only within that realm, then the duty to serve innocent clients by volunteering the truth is trumped. For the system's sake, the lawyer must make sure that lawyers both speak accurately and that judges do not undermine confidentiality in the advocate's role by asking the inappropriate question. If lawyers universally decline to answer the question, judges will see no further point to the inquiry. Therefore, the innocent client's interest must be subordinated to the legal system's interest in stopping judges from destroying the system. Interestingly, though, Professor Friedman would be horrified by this result. His approach of lying ultimately would achieve exactly the same result. Um, because if lawyers always answer, my client is innocent, for both guilty and innocent defendants, the judges asking the question are soon going to get tired of the dialogue. The downside to Friedman's way of reaching this outcome is that, in the process, the lying lawyer also will have undermined everyone's ability to trust his word, including, incidentally, the client who has observed the lawyer lie. More about that in a, little, in, in a few minutes. But having offered my proposal, I have to confess to a crisis of conscience. Was I acting improperly as a defense attorney when I vouched for my worthy clients to prosecutors in plea bargaining and to judges at sentencing? And here's my thought on that. Under the law in most jurisdictions, lawyers are forbidden to vouch for their clients at trial. In other words, they can't, for example, express their personal opinion about a client's innocence to a jury in closing argument. And the reason for that are, are, are mainly the same one uh, I've already mentioned. If lawyers were allowed to vouch but not to lie for guilty defendants, savvy jurors would very quickly be able to tell from lawyers' arguments which clients deserve to be convicted. So is the situation any different when a lawyer vouches for the client in plea bargaining or, or at sentencing? Maybe a bit. Because as a practical matter, prosecutors assume that all defendants are guilty and unworthy. And that's also the legitimate starting point for sentencing judges, because at that point, the defendants already have been convicted. The defendant who the lawyer believes can't comply with unusual conditions of diversion or probation isn't put into a worse position when her lawyer fails to extol her non-existent virtues. She'll be treated fairly in the world assumed by the prosecutor and the sentencing judge. In contrast, the trustworthy defendant will be treated unfairly if the lawyer fails to contradict the prosecutor's or the judge's assumptions. Now, don't take this too far. Uh, if extended too far, this would become very problematic because every defendant is entitled to aggressive counsel. But the reality is that aggressiveness takes a lot of different forms. And what lawyers can do for different clients always is limited by the facts and the governing rules. The good defense lawyer is not the one who vouches for every client equally, but the one who maximizes each client's position given the system's constraints, and rules like the prohibition against lying are part of those constraints. Still, I don't feel entirely comfortable about where my analysis has led. Uh, you might wonder why I keep uh, second-guessing myself, and, and I apologize for that but I, I share a fear of going too far with uh, Cordell Hull, a former Secretary of State who was known for being a very cautious man. Uh, just as an example, he was traveling on a train one day with a friend uh, when the train passed a flock of sheep. And just to make conversation, the friend said, look, sir, those sheep have been recently shorn. It appears so, said Hull, at least on the side facing us. <laughs> I, I, I'm similarly hesitant um, I, I'm similarly hesitant about my response to Friedman's hypothetical because it seems so counterintuitive to me that a lawyer should avoid telling a judge truthfully that a client is innocent. Yet I do think that saying my client is innocent at the pretrial stage presents exactly the same danger as vouching in closing arguments. Pretrial, judges, like jurors, are still supposed to be presuming innocence for all defendants. When the hypothetical judge inquires about a client's culpability, there's nothing wrong with pointing to exculpatory evidence or reminding the judge of the presumption of innocence. But because her question would eliminate the presumption for guilty defendants, the lawyer shouldn't help make the question effective. The duty to preserve the system requires a response that hurts the lawyer's innocent client 
in the same way as refraining from vouching in summations. One attraction of the so-called groom principle is that it simplifies lawyers' lives. If the ethic of zeal requires entire devotion to the client, meaning that all other considerations have to give way, then a lawyer doesn't need to balance competing values, nor does the lawyer need to contextualize. He can follow the same exclusive principle when giving advice, negotiating, or engaging in cooperative transactions. But the lawyer's life isn't that simple, and, and legal ethics standards have never treated it as simple. Professor Friedman seems to recognize as much uh, in, in trying to justify his departure from the prohibition against lying, he says, there are moral and ethical considerations beyond the rules themselves that should inform the lawyer's professional conduct. This frees Friedman to refer to a series of biblical uh, anecdotes or biblical illustrations which suggest that under some circumstances, lies can be morally justified. Now, that's really a relatively uncontroversial conclusion. Sometimes lying may make sense. And it should have left Friedman in, in, in the same quandary I find myself, with the task of accommodating the conflicting values and considerations that affect lawyers. It should have left him with an answer, whatever the answer might be, that feels unsettling and unsatisfying. Unfortunately, Friedman jumps from the conclusion that lying by lawyers sometimes might be warranted back to the comfort zone of the simple single ethic. Lying by the hypothetical lawyer is technically accurate, Friedman asserts, because the client is presumed to be innocent. The lawyer owes his client devotion and therefore should tell the lie that is no lie. With all due respect, that's wordplay, and it avoids the very issue that Friedman has done us the favor of presenting. By relying on his exclusive paradigm of the lawyer's function, Friedman obviates serious consideration of how lawyers should accommodate the various roles that ethics codes and judicial regulators have always recognized. Felix Frankfurt, his wife, used to say about Felix's speeches, there are two things wrong with Felix's speeches. Uh, first, he tends to get off the subject. Second, he always comes back to it. Um, <laughs> at, at the risk of heading down the same path, let me digress for a minute and consider the issue of lawyers and lying more broadly. Um, at one point in his article, Professor Friedman suggests that moral philosophy might inform the debate. Uh, but actually, his only philosophical references are to these biblical anecdotes I mentioned. In fact, the question of when it's appropriate to lie is a subject that moral philosophers have addressed in quite a bit of detail. There are quite a number of books about it. Um, in her most famous work, the Swedish philosopher, who also happened to marry a, a Harvard Law School dean, um, Cicela Bach uh, considered lying from several angles. Um, one of her approaches was to look at how lying affects the actors involved in the lie. The recipient of the lie, uh, the person who may be harmed or helped by it, and the liar himself. And I think it's worth considering those perspectives here. We, we mentioned the system's interest in truth-telling by lawyers. But what about the interests of the individual judge? Sooner or later, she'll suspect a lawyer has lied, particularly when the lawyer tells her in case after case that his client is innocent. At that point, the judge will not only distrust this lawyer, but likely other lawyers as well, and, and not only in the context of the guilt-innocence question. When the lawyer tells the judge that his client, perhaps the very client that the judge asked about, that tells, tells the judge that this client is not a flight risk, cannot post bail, is willing to enter a rehabilitation facility, or has no criminal record, the judge will not believe a word the lawyer says. In Bach's terms, we, when lied to, have no way to judge which lies are the trivial ones. She concludes from the perspective of the person deceived that there must be a minimal degree of trust in communication for language and action to be more than stabs in the dark. That is why some minimal level of truthfulness has always been seen as essential to human society. And then there's the client who has watched the lawyer declare her innocence, knowing that she has told the lawyer she's guilty of sin. The client certainly is going to be grateful to the lawyer who knows no one but the client, but will she trust the lawyer in the future, which is, after all, the goal of convincing the client that the lawyer is her ally? Maybe not. The lawyer has lied to the judge's face. He may lie to the client, too. 
What's more, the lawyer has made it clear that lying to the court is part of the game. Obviously, criminal defendants already have incentives to lie themselves in, in testimony and sentencing or to their probation officers. But society does harbor the hope that sometimes they'll be honest, particularly when taking an oath to take, tell the truth. Why should they, however, when the lawyers make it clear that truth-telling is discretionary? Maybe the most important perspective is that of the lying lawyer himself. As a criminal defendant, the defense attorney, he can perhaps be proud that he has vindicated Broom's ideal, but not so proud that he's going to tell his mother the story over tea. As Bach puts it, liars usually weigh only the immediate harm to others from the lie against the benefits they want to achieve. The flaw in such an outlook is that it ignores or underestimates two additional kinds of harm, the harm that lying does to the liars themselves and the harm done to the general level of trust and social cooperation. Lying comes at a personal cost, not only to how the lawyer has to think of himself, but also to his sense of being part of the community. He can't help but feel isolated. The only ones who are going to understand him, even if he acted correctly, are other lawyers. As Bach says, a liar often does diminish himself by lying, and the loss is precisely to his dignity, his integrity. There also is a slippery slope. Bach asks us to consider this. If lawyers become used to accepting certain lies, how will this affect their integrity in other areas? She suggests that the harms arising from lying are increased by the fact that so few lies are solitary ones. So if lying is okay in this hypothetical, in what other circumstances does the adversarial ethic mandate it? Professor Friedman suggests negotiations and settlement conferences on the, on the theory that negotiating conventions justify deceit. But there's a flaw in that reasoning. Client-oriented advocacy at trial rests on the premise that neutral fact finders, the judge and, and jurors, oversee the competition between advocates. They sift the conflicting arguments, identify misstatements, and impose an appropriate result. These safeguards for good results don't exist when lawyers lie in negotiations. Here, as elsewhere, if client orientation and conventions are all that guide lawyers, lawyers really can't know whether lying is morally justified. And Bach suggests that after the first lies, others come more easily. Psychological barriers wear down. Lies seem more necessary, less reprehensible. The psychological perspectives of the actors I've discussed all militate against lying in our hypothetical. It's again only when we consider the one remaining actor that the issue becomes complicated, the innocent defendant. From her perspective, too, lying is bad. The lawyer's willingness to lie in general would have a negative effect on this client. But that's because the innocent client wants the benefit of having a lawyer who can tell the truth and will be believed. If we accept the position that I've tentatively proposed, that the lawyer should decline to answer the judge's question regarding innocence, this client is harmed not by a lie, but by the lawyer's failure to volunteer the truth. Psychologically, this client may trust the lawyer less in the future and certainly will have less faith in the justice system. Whether the lawyer can explain his rationale, the obligation to keep the system functioning well for all clients, guilty and innocent alike, is a challenge to the lawyer's persuasiveness. So, even the council of philosophers like Bach doesn't lead to an easy solution to our hypothetical. Yet moral philosophy can help us understand the consequences of lying in a way that resort to a simple rule or adversarial ethic cannot. Bach resolves her own attitude toward the complex issues like this. Trust, in some degree of veracity, functions as a foundation of relations among human beings. When this trust shatters or wears away, institutions collapse. Such a principle need not indicate that all lies should be ruled out, but it does suggest at least one immediate limitation on lying. In any situation where a lie is possible, is a possible choice, one must first seek truthful alternatives. And that's what I've tried to do today. Let me close with a global point or two, uh, which may help explain why I picked today's topic. And these require me to refer a few last times to our wise man, Bob Lowry. Uh, in my remarks, I've taken Bob's name in, in vain several times. 
and I hope that I haven't mischaracterized his views. I, I don't know how he would resolve the specific issue that I've addressed. But I am fairly certain of this. He wouldn't consider the question one that can be resolved mechanically. Commenting on the public's attitude toward lawyers, Bob had this to say. In popular literature, the lawyer's role as advocate is similar to that of the lone gun gunfighter who, against all odds, restores peace and establishes justice by slaying the forces of evil. Reality is more complex and far less dramatic than that. Bob noted further that the system itself is designed to have lawyers perform a variety of tasks for a variety of clients in a variety of settings. The ethical responsibilities of lawyers change depending on the type of task, the client, and the setting. Bob, in his career, never tried to answer all the hard questions that lawyers might face. And to my knowledge, he never considered the specific lying issue that I've discussed today. But I think he'd share my instinct that discarding a lawyer's duty of candor in favor of the ethic of zeal has serious costs for the institution of the law. Bob wrote, the lawyer's primary goal to the legal system is an affirmative one. It is not another way of saying the lawyer's obligation to the is to the client as prescribed or limited by the law. He also said, I believe that if lawyers were more committed to their primary obligation of playing by the rules, many of the major problems of distortion would be eliminated. If lawyers made it a practice to play tough but fair, I believe the best traditions would be revitalized. The various camps within the field of professional responsibility have divergent views on the ways lawyers should act, and the hypothetical I've discussed is a specific illustration of how the debate plays out. Friedman, assuming that the, brooms et the broom ethic is controlling, he, said, he suggests one response to a rule that forbids lying. The Hoffman camp might suggest that lawyers be guided by their personal consciences. I've offered an approach that identifies competing values and acknowledges institutional inter interests that should be accommodated. Although the hypothetical is, I think, an interesting intellectual exercise, I doubt that the specific issue it raises has any enduring significance. All participants in the system usually understand their core functions and avoid putting the other participants in situations that undermine their functions. Judges, in other words, are unlikely to ask the question the hypothetical posits. If they do, judges will quickly take the hint that it's unreasonable. The intellectual exercise itself, however, does have some importance because it highlights the different ways one might think about the lawyer's role or roles. I've suggested that lawyers have multiple functions and conflicting obligations that can't be resolved by resort to a single paradigm. Bob Lowry, again, had it right when he said, Reform of lawyers' ethics within the adversary system is a secondary challenge to the task of getting the central idea of lawyering straight to begin with. So thank you, Bob, for your insights, and thank you all for your patience and attention. to uh, Bob before, my ability to put together uh, PowerPoint presentations has diminished tremendously now that my last child has gone off to college. <laughs> um, but uh, we have a few, few minutes for questions if there are.
good, Your Honor, and you don't take less than $100,000. Those are statements that are asserted and are false. Okay, I think you take the term lies literally. There are a couple of kinds of statements that you would use that may not be the equivalent of what is said. Some are statements that judges understand, that people understand are not true. Others may be statements that are not substantive. The point of this hypothetical, if I could read it, is that you have a statement by the lawyer that was intended, specifically intended by the Supreme Court. Now, if, and he gives funny wording, he gives some funny wording. I have no doubt that my client is not guilty, because he says, all right, that sort of meshes with the presumption of innocence, so I'm not really lying here. And, you know, if the judge really understands what he's saying, and I can't understand the question, well, then he's eliminating the interesting part of the hypothetical. The judge knows it's not actually, and there's no credence to be given to that. Then he can be close to my position, except that the judge says nothing, nothing he says can be trusted. But, you know, there's a range of things one says, and some are justified, and some are harmless. This is not one that's going to fit into that category. This is one that is a substantive intent to deceive and mislead the court. It's a question of whether the lawyer should be able to do it. In my DUI practice, and in my newsletter to my clients, I tell them that, you know, if you're stopped for a non-moving violation, the officer asks you, do you have a break key? You're not under oath, and I tell them you have to lie, because you automatically provide probable cause to that officer to continue the investigation for DUI if you say, yeah, I've had a drink, or something of that equivalent. And I've been called to task somewhat by other lawyers and friends that, you know, the officer is also an officer of the court, so I can't tell a client to lie to him just because he's not under oath. Am I in trouble on that, ethically? Ethically, if he's under the rules, we can get into a long debate of whether you're using the client as an agent to do something that applies to court yourself, and you're just providing information, or whether you're telling the client to do an illegal act. You tell the client to do something that's illegal, and you can't do that, obviously. But you have it because it's not a, it's just a lie. So, are you a bad boy? Have you committed any disciplinary violations? I don't know. We'd have to go through the rules. Have you done anything illegal? No. Doesn't the legal system provide incentives for lawyers to lie by having unjust laws on the books, and by having penalties for just laws too harsh? I mean, if somebody's going to be locked up for the rest of their life for stealing cookies out of a 7-Eleven, under the three strikes and you're out law, I would think that there would be a lot of incentive for that lawyer to lie. We don't have to take extreme cases. There are lots of incentives for lawyers to lie, you know, ranging down to how young we are. So, the justifications for lies, you know, range. There may come a time when a lawyer may engage in civil disobedience, and I'm not going to follow the rules, I'm not going to follow, because there is good enough reason for it. But our solution to that situation is that we have a system, we're supposed to provide the best representation we can within the rules of the game for the lawyer, for the client who's faced with three strikes. And, you know, that's how we provide it. Going back to the question before, you know, another one of the lies of the lawyer in the example is that he came in and said, my client won't accept less than this or make an assertion. 
well, they're wise and they're wise. And, 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 and common wisdom among lawyers as well, with, you know, everybody knows that what you say in negotiation it isn't a lie. It's a right? I, I've never felt terrible comments <laughs> But you know, when, when you say things that are expected to expected to be relied on, that people think you are asserting as a truthful statement of fact, I say don't no. lie. I think one can accomplish the exact same things in negotiations without uh, engaging in direct lying. Now, where where you come out on the company question um, is it, 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 another matter. By the way, truthful lie is not a second thing. Just before we, everyone, disperses, I just wanted to pr present Professor Zacharias with uh, a token of our appreciation. Thank you.